My project is a foray into the exciting world of platforms computing. And now since, or for the last 25 years, the number of transistors on a computer processor has been increasing ex exponentially. And this increase has been due to um, a continuous decrease in the size of a transistor. And of course, a transistor is like the building block of a computer processor. And because so many transistors can get fit onto a single chip, um, personal computers that are on the market today are getting just faster and faster. But there's going to be a time when transistors are going to reach a fundamental barrier, and they won't be able to get any smaller. And once this happens, uh, computers won't be able to get faster anymore just by virtue of having more transistors on a chip because it will no longer be practical. And so in order to continue to make personal computers go faster, uh, we're going to have to change our way of thinking, so to speak. And this new paradigm is known as parallel programming. In it, your program, instead of being uh, submitted to only a single processor, it's going to be submitted to uh, more than one processor at once. You're going to take a, a given job and separate it into its constituent tasks and distribute it among the processors. And then uh, those, the results of those processes will be compiled at the end. And the beauty of this model is that for every processor that you add, you effectively receive a 100% gain in speed over only a single processor. Unfortunately, parallel programming isn't as simple as just adding processors. Uh, there's a significant amount of uh, extra work that goes into it. And to demonstrate that, consider if task 4 had to wait for the result for task 3 before it can start executing. And then similarly, task 6 has to wait for task 2 to finish. Task 6 has to do a whole bunch of computations before task 1 can start. Task 5 has a whole bunch of work to do before anything else can continue. So with all these complicated processor communications going on, there has to be a method to the madness. There has to be a standard way in which the processes can uh, communicate with each other. And there are dozens of models available for uh, different ways that these processes can communicate. And in my project, I investigated the various ways that uh, processes can communicate. And I wanted to find one that would make it easy for scientists to be able to uh, quickly, in terms, of, uh, in terms of development time, quickly develop a parallel algorithm that was still uh, highly efficient. And in my project, I decided to uh, use a simulation of the two-dimensional heat equation. Um, this is an example of a grid that I might come up with. Imagine that each one of these points is like a little piece of like a block of air in a box. And along the outsides, uh, where the grid is red, uh, those cells are considered hot. And then similarly, the, those on the left that are black are cold, and those in the middle are lukewarm. And throughout the simulation, the temperature around the outside of the grid is going to remain constant, but the temperature on the inside is going to change. So what I want to know is how long does it take for the temperature on the inside to stabilize? And I also want to know uh, how is the heat distributed once, once it has stabilized? And just so that you can kind of get the gist of what's going to happen, um, after one time step, you can see that uh, on the left side here, the grid, it's got, these boxes have gotten colder, those have gotten warmer, and uh, so it goes. Now, with a grid this small, you could probably work this all out uh, with pen and paper. It might take you a lot of paper and a lot of patience, but you could do it. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to do it with a much larger grid, uh, which is when a, a computer simulation uh, comes in handy. Now, I wrote this particular simulation. Oh, this is a bad projector, sorry. There's, there's actually a scale over there of the uh, temperatures that makes it difficult to see, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, I wrote this particular simulation, and it executed and found the solution for this problem within only a few minutes. But if a scientist were going to use this, uh, this same simulation, you can bet your bottom dollar that he's going to have a host of other stipulations that I didn't include in my simulation. For example, uh, the grid would be many, many times larger. Or uh, different cells in the grid might represent different materials, so therefore they would change temperature at a faster or slower rate. So with all these extra variables, the simulation is going to get more and more complex, 
and therefore it's going to take longer and longer to execute. And it's going to get to a point where you're not going to be able to execute it on your uh, personal computer anymore, which is where parallelization comes in. So now that I've decided what uh, test case I'm going to use to uh, examine various ways for parallelization, uh, I had to choose a particular model. And so now the question becomes, how do I parallelize? And when parallelizing an algorithm, there are three elements that have to be considered. The first of which is parallelism, parallelism itself. Um, to parallelize an algorithm, certain portion, oh, sorry, only certain portions of an algorithm can be parallelized. And the more that are, the faster that algorithm is going to uh, going to execute, and the more efficient it's going to be. However, not everything can be parallel. Uh, some things still have to remain serial, such as waiting for user input. Uh, synchronization has to be considered. So, for example, if one process is waiting for a number between 1 and 10, then another process better be about to give it a number between 1 and 10, otherwise bad things are going to happen. So, the third thing that has to be considered is communication. If there's a given data set distributed among several processes, then it has to be set forth exactly which process is going to get what data. And then when that data changes, how each process can alert the other processes, hey, my data is different. And there are dozens and dozens of models available for answering these questions in different ways. Uh, but each of these models falls into one of the four levels of abstraction. And I won't be able to go into those right now, unfortunately. But the gist of it is that at each level of abstraction, there's a trade-off between the amount of control that the programmer has over his program, the amount of efficiency that he can get out of it, and the amount of code that he has to write. And at the lowest level of abstraction, the programmer does everything explicitly. He says one process can start, one can stop, everything about communication. But uh, as, you might ex as you might consider, um, that would take a lot more code from the programmer, and also he'd have to do a lot more debugging. So for the rest of the presentation, I'd like to show you how at the second level of abstraction, the programmer can write efficient code, but it isn't going to take him as long as at the first level of abstraction. Uh, in my project, I found that the bulk synchronous parallel model, or the BSP model, is particularly uh, attractive for parallelization. Now, in the BSP model, the various processes operate concurrently until they reach a checkpoint. And when one process reaches that checkpoint, it waits for all of the rest of them to sort of catch up with it. And at that point, any communication that has to happen uh, is executed. And then, right there, synchronization is achieved. So then uh, computation can begin in the next step, and the process continues. And there are two main advantages to the BSP model that make it uh, particularly advantageous to the programmer. The first of which is that communication and synchronization are always linked. That is, uh, in practice, the programmer knows that whenever he calls a communication method, then he can automatically assume that the processes are going to be synchronized before they continue to execute. And the second thing that makes uh, the BSP model attractive is its definite computational step. Uh, it makes it easier for the programmer to know when he's doing computations. Therefore, his code is easier to read, or, or excuse me, it's easier to write, and then also easier to read later. 